Sap color ring So I'm cling ring string Text 7 Pratyakshanumana Agama Pramanani Vedic instruction is composed of direct perception, pratyaksha, inference, anumana, and competent evidence, agama. Text 8 Viparyayo mityagnanam tadrupa pratishtam Indiscrimination or error is false knowledge established on form or nature. Namaste. So there is a huge insight contained within these two little sutras. And what is it? That real knowledge comes from the Vedas and that false knowledge is established on name and form. Let me just run that by you again. Real knowledge comes from Vedas, and false knowledge, error, or indiscrimination, is based on name and form. So first, he describes the real knowledge that it consists of direct perception, pratyaksha. Now, direct perception can only be of the self. It can only be perception of pure consciousness by itself. Awareness of awareness. Because there is no instrumentality required for this perception. Pratyaksha. Huh? It means seeing directly. So ordinary seeing with the eyes requires a whole instrumentality of the mind, the senses, the body, huh? The, the eyes, the brain, the nervous system, a whole thing, a processing array. Huh? Without this instrumentality, we cannot perceive things through the senses. So that is not direct perception. That's apratyaksha. But pratyaksha is direct. Consciousness perceiving consciousness. Awareness perceiving awareness. So once you have this, that's it. Game over. You have, you have realized the highest truth. But there is also, there is more. Huh? Inference. Anumana. Anumana means that one speaks about the truth indirectly. And then there is a, a gap between what is directly stated and the actual truth. So the reader has to fill that gap by inference, by indirect logic. So this is a test. See, the original Vedas, what we have of them, the original Veda was actually much, much more voluminous, maybe a hundred times of what we have today. And pieces of it were gradually lost because it was an oral tradition. And then Vyasadeva, about 5,000 years ago, assembled all the texts, wrote them down, and divided them into four. The Rik, Sama, Atarva, and Yajur Vedas. So these four, he then entrusted to his four principal disciples, and then they have come on down to us in the present day. And then, of course, the Upanishads. The Upanishads 
are the instructional parts of the Vedas. The others are more or less uh, instructions, but for sacrifices, for ceremonies. The Upanishads are the instructions for self-realization. Upaani shat. Huh? Come here and sit down <laughs> and listen. So this means to approach a guru, to approach a realized being and hear from him and inquire from him about one's doubts. One should be completely transparent. And if there's anything that one does not understand or cannot accept, one has to question until those doubts are resolved. That is the duty of the disciple. And the duty of the guru is to give the instruction that resolves those doubts, which sometimes may be in the form of verbal knowledge, but sometimes and probably more impactful is when the master or the guru arranges a situation to illustrate a certain teaching. And I could tell hours and hours of stories about that. <laughs> But we have to cover this material in 15 minutes, so, <laughs> or everybody will leave. <laughs> 618, so they're probably leaving already, anyway. I always keep the best stuff, you know, for the last, the end of the video. So this video is going to have a special ending. <laughs> anyway, but you won't understand it unless you watch the whole thing. <laughs> anyway. So then what else is there? Agama. There's a whole class of Vedic literatures simply called Agama. And they're basically descriptions of the realizations of the sages. And sometimes these are about uh, gods and demigods and so on. And sometimes these are about meditational experiences or they can be instructions on how to uh, reach certain realizations and so forth. So these three kinds of evidence, Pratyaksha, Anumana, and Agama, are the parts or elements of which the Vedic knowledge is composed. Now, remember in the previous verse, previous sutra, he said that of the five kinds of vrittis, some are uh, with suffering, klesha, and some are aklesha, without suffering. Well, you can probably guess that the Vedic instructions are aklesha. They do not lead to suffering. In fact, they lead to great bliss. <laughs> but you have to follow them. It's not enough to simply read about them or to discuss with others. You have to actually put it into practice. Then you get the result, not before. Now, regarding the next sutra, I could not find the proper translation in any of the versions of these sutras that I have in English. They all get it mixed up. And I think they get it mixed up because they haven't realized it. So, indiscrimination or error is false knowledge. Well, discrimination of what? Between the seer and the seen. Drig drishya vivekaha. This is indiscrimination. One does not realize the difference between the living consciousness and dead matter. So the body, the mind, the senses, and their objects, and all the stuff that we think we are and have, like the you know, our possessions and so on. These are all dead matter. These things cause suffering when we come into association with them. So this is wrong knowledge because it's indiscrimination. And the telling part is false knowledge established on form. Tadrupa pratishtam. This form established on. Pratishta means established. So when our knowledge is established on form, when, in other words, it's name and form, the forms of the world, the jagat or jagrat, 
are given different, different names. And then we construct all kinds of houses of cards based on these names. And then when the house of cards collapses, <laughs> oh, we're so disappointed. Huh? But we set it up in the first place by believing in these names and forms. Uh, the poor scientists, for example, they're so bewildered because their knowledge is all based on form. Real knowledge is based on the formless, on consciousness, on awareness, on the subjective. After all, if there was no scientist to read the instruments, who would there be to come up with all these crazy theories? <laughs> they don't trust their own observation. So they, they use the instruments. But without consciousness, what would become of these instruments? Who would set them up? Anyway, we have taught a great deal on this channel about a goddess. The goddess Lalita, huh? or Maya, that which is not. And this is a metaphor. So let me unfold this metaphor. Let me unpack the meaning hidden in this metaphor. The goddess is described as a very beautiful and playful woman, Lalita. And she is armed with a bow made of sugarcane and five arrows made of flowers. And by these weapons, she, she dominates the whole universe. So what is the meaning? The goddess herself represents consciousness, that is, awareness with an object. The bow represents the mind. Sugarcane is sweet, so the mind is always looking for pleasure. And the five arrows represent the five senses. Hearing, sight, smell, taste, and touch. So, to put it in another way, consciousness is bewildering us by means of the mind which is involved in a constant search for sweetness, for pleasure. Cupid, by the way, is armed with the same weapons. <laughs> so by lust, firing the f arrows of the five senses with the bow of the mind, she keeps the whole universe under control under her subjugation. So, when one realizes this, when one understands this, not just in theory, but in practice, that's liberation. It's not that one has to kill the mind or um, kill the senses or the body by austere um, practices and stuff like this. That's going too far. One has to simply realize that this body, the senses, the mind, are maya, their form, nature, mother nature, maya, that which is not. See, these perceptions of form are always changing, isn't it? If I look around the room, the wall is one color, the window is a different color, the microphone has a different shape from the walls or the floor or the ceiling, and so does the camera. Outside, it's bright. Inside, is a little darker. Huh? And so on and so forth. We see so many changes. Today, I feel good. Maybe tomorrow, I have a cold or something and I don't feel so good. Everything's always changing in form. The body grows old and then it dies. These changes give suffering because really what we want is something that never changes. Now the closest thing that most people get to something that doesn't change 
is this process of showering arrows of flowers. Huh? In other words, processing all these sense impressions with the mind. But even that is interrupted at the time of death. So if one bases one's whole thinking on something that's going to change, something that's going to go away, the body or the mind, huh? this is suffering, tremendous suffering. And this attachment to form is indiscrimination, it's error, it's foolishness, because it leads to taking another body and being enmeshed again in the same network of illusions. So, when one realizes that actually I am Brahman, I am Shiva, Shivoham, I have no need for this Maya. Oh, then she becomes very submissive. <laughs> she no longer is firing arrows. Uh, then she wants to come and embrace you. <laughs> but of course, Shiva, being the absolute, being the Brahman, is not disturbed by this. She can embrace him all she wants. He's not going to get involved. So eventually she gives up and goes away. This is the actual goal of the yoga practice. Realization of the chit shakti. Chit means consciousness, or more properly, unconditioned consciousness, pure awareness. And this is the shakti that makes possible the creation of the entire world. And then she comes under the yogi's control. And this is self-realization. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum. <laughs>